I'm Melvra Long, and I'm a part of a group that is working right now to start a new museum in the Midwest. We want this to be a comprehensive museum that covers the whole period of glass making, which at this point in time is 400 years in the United States. Um, there are millions of children who've never been to a glass museum. And we want this museum to be a place where they can come and learn about glass and enjoy the colors, the beautiful designs, and um, bring their parents and learn about their culture. Older children and adults might be interested too in the economics of glass making in this country. It has provided jobs for many families down through the years. It has provided an outlet for creative people who designed glass and who uh, formulated the uh, color formulas to make glass. And we want this video to help you understand what our purpose is, what our mission is, and how we plan to go about uh, fulfilling that mission in the glass world. I've been collecting glass for about 30 years. And I've always had to go back to the East Coast to see a museum. One day as we were driving back from West Virginia, it occurred to me that the Midwestern part of our country has no museum, nothing that is comprehensive, that covers the whole uh, scope of glass making. And it occurred to me that this would be a worthy project. One of the major reasons for establishing the uh, first settlement at Jamestown was glass making. In fact, uh, in the first expedition to form that settlement, they included glass workers from uh, Poland and from Germany. And uh, when they arrived in Jamestown in 1607, they immediately started uh, building a glass furnace. And by 1608, they were producing glass there. As other uh, colonies were formed in America, they too built glass houses, or most of them did. In the beginning, uh, glass was also mostly green glass, uh, either that or crystal, no, no color at all. But uh, some of the glass was just referred to as green glass. Most of the glass that was made back then had bubbles and, and rough places. It uh, was not crystal clear as we say today. In the 1950s, uh, a replica of this glass house was built in, at Jamestown uh, to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the first glass house. And today, you can visit this part, this part of the park at Jamestown and see them make glass like they did a long time ago. And uh, this little green glass pitcher uh, is one of the uh, reproductions that they now make there. They make other shapes as well. But you can see that the quality is not what we would expect in glass today. From 1608 to around 1700, there were only four glass companies that achieved any measure of success whatsoever. You can see on this map that a lot of companies had been formed and had produced glass, but only those with the circled dots were able to survive for any length of time and produce glass that became known uh, later on. Not much history has been salvaged from this period because remember, we were still under the rule of England. And uh, actually, until after the Revolutionary War, we don't have a lot of information on any of the glass factories. But after the Revolution, uh, several other companies did start producing glass. And uh, little by little, it, it built up. 
the only the oldest piece of glass that I have ever owned is from a factory that started in business in 1773 and it was located in Pennsylvania. This vase uh, is an example of the type of glass that they were making during that period of time. And you can see, it's, I think it's attractive. I really like it. But the glass is not very uh, good quality. And uh, the decorations uh, were required a great deal of skill, actually. But uh, they, too, are crudely placed on the piece. This kind of glass continued to be made right on up through uh, 1800. Glass making in America actually didn't get off to a running start until after 1800. They still were having trouble with England and trade. There were so many restrictions and uh, rules and regulations. And so they fought another war in 18 and 12 to try to settle this matter. And after that, the English uh, removed their restrictions by agreement and uh, things started moving along. Uh, from 18 and 12 until 18 and 40, I believe the dates are, there were at least a hundred glass factories established in this country. Isn't that amazing? And each one was producing some kind of glass. Some of them specialized in window glass and some in bottles and jars, and others tried to do uh, more decorative types of glass. And, but from this period, from 1812 until, uh, oh, the 1880s, 1890s, actually, some of the most beautiful glass that we've ever produced was made here in this country. The Boston and Sandwich Glass Company was, was one that produced a lot of glass for a long period of time. The New England Glass Company uh, was a famous glass company that did a lot of art glass and other types of glass. Mount Washington is known by most glass collectors as being an outstanding glass company, and there were many others. Uh, but each one contributed its, uh, his uh, special type of glass. In uh, 1826, Deming Jarvis, uh, invented a way to press glass by just pulling a lever by hand. And this revolutionized glass making. Before that time, they had always blown the glass into the mold to achieve a pattern and a shape. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, this little uh, basket. This was made at the Sandwich Glass Company. So this, this is the, the uh, basic piece right here. And it looks like it was blown into a mold. It may have been shaped by tools to achieve this shape. But as you can see, the handle had to be attached separately and that had to be done by hand. It's even a different color, you see. And then look at the bottom of this little basket. Can you see that? This was just a flat piece of glass that was stuck on there when the basket was hot. And then the glass worker designed these little flowers. He probably had something that looked like a cookie cutter and he just stamped the design on the, the hot piece of glass. And then he formed these little leaves. He may have stamped the little grooves in them and then curled them with a tool. This uh, also, and you notice here how rough this is. It feels like sandpaper, coarse sandpaper. But actually what this is, is a ground up glass, crystal glass, that was added to this before they started working on it. But this was called overshot glass at Sandwich Factory. A little bit later at the Sandwich Factory, a man came to work for them by the name of uh, Nicholas Lutz. 
and he was a perfectionist. He, dis he invented or found a way to make glass that they call threaded glass. And you can see why it's called threaded glass because these little ridges are actually threads that were pulled out from the glass and added to this piece as it turned on a turnstile. And then at that point, it was probably just a bubble of glass. And then when they uh, finished putting the threads on, they cut the top part off and shaped it into the bowl shape that they wanted. This bottom piece, the underplate, had to be shaped a different way, so they had to use tools to do that. And then last of all, they did the, the crimping, and that too was done by with a, a tool that they used. Of course, tools don't do all the work. It takes skill even to operate tools. And so this bowl really required a lot of skill to make. <laughs> Remember now that since um, 18 and 12, uh, more and more glass factories were coming into operation, causing lots of competition. But of course, you know, competition is sometimes good because it motivates people to uh, try to come up with new ideas and use their uh, creative ability to uh, make better products and more attractive products. Many other types of glass were made during this period. There were great artists such as uh, uh, Tiffany, Louis Comfort Tiffany, and uh, uh, the Steuben people were making glass at this time. And uh, there were other companies that made beautiful, beautiful art glass. But in the 1920s, uh, several companies came out with colored glass dinner services. They would make everything that you could possibly use to set a table in colored glass. And they did advertising campaigns that tried to sell the idea that glass would not break any easier than china would, that it could withstand heat and cold and the extremes. And so they were successful. They sold a lot of dinnerware during the uh, mid-twenties on up through the, till World War II. I want you to meet my grandson, William Chester Long. We call him Will. Will has never been to a glass museum because they're all too far away. But he loves glass, and he likes his grandfather's paperweight collection. He's been playing with those paperweights ever since he was a little boy. And I'm sure that if Will had the opportunity, he would love to go to a glass museum and see a big collection of paperweights and learn how, uh, how they were made, or at least more about it. Here in middle America, our children need to have the opportunity to visit a glass museum. They would learn so much more about their cultural heritage, about the, um, the things that are so beautiful about glass, and children are automatically attracted to color anyway. This would be an opportunity for them to see a part of our country and our history that otherwise they will probably never see. I believe that it's just as important for our children to know about their cultural heritage as it is to know about their economic and political heritage. We're going to suggest some ways that you might be able to uh, get involved in the museum project. We're offering you um, memberships at different levels. You can be a founding member of this museum for a contribution of $1,000. You can be a charter member for $500, or you can be a century member for $100. A hundred years from now, your descendants may see your name 
permanently displayed in this museum. I appreciate the opportunity to share our vision with you, and I hope that you will be as eager as I am to be a part of it. Obviously, we're gonna need a lot of glass for this museum, but I think it'll be a wonderful opportunity for anyone who has amassed a, a collection of glass over a long period of time to be, ensure, be assured that it will be enjoyed for generations to come by the children and the, and the people who come to visit that museum. In 2008, we will be celebrating, I hope, 400 years of glassmaking in this country. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have this museum operating by that time? Think about it. A museum of glass in the Midwest celebrating 400 years of glassmaking in America. It has changed our culture in many ways. It has influenced the way we live. And I think we owe it to our children to preserve this history and to make sure that they have examples of the glass that was made in the past. And in this way, I believe that they will somehow be connected to their past. It will be a shining memorial that will be a beckoning light to people from our own country and from people around the world who will come to see what the artisans in the United States have been able to do with glass. If you would like to participate in this project, contact the person hosting this presentation for information. You may contact Milbra Long personally by writing to her at P.O. Box 784, Cleburne, Texas, 76033-0784, by calling her at 817-645-6066, or by emailing longseat at sbcglobal.net. The Museum of Glass Made in America Incorporated is on the World Wide Web at www.magma.com.